Welcome to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. What's F&B got to do with it? Let's welcome your host, Tracy Stuckra. Thank you, John. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today? Um, I Well, before I go anywhere, I want to know who in the audience knows what F&B stands for. Let, put it in the chat. Because if you're not in meetings and events, you might not know what that is. Um, tell me what it is actually, Ken, or very good. Thank you, Ken. You got the, um, you wrote it out because, and actually when, when we talk our jargon as meeting planners, um, fun, you're funny, John, um, we talk in a lot of acronyms as other people do in other industries as well. And sometimes people don't know what F and B means. And so if you're a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert, you might not know that F and B means food and beverage. So I just want to make sure that everybody understood that as we get forward. So the, I, we're, like I said, we've got a lot to cover today. And um, a couple of things that I wanted to let you know up front that we're going to cover um, is how it, DEI, so here we go with the acronyms, how diversity, equity, and inclusion and food and beverage are connected. And, you know, you, you might not think how they are, but they, they are um, improve employee well-being through food and beverage. And that, so that's really around the DEI initiatives and then identify ways to create safe and inclusive dining experiences. So whether you are um, a meeting planner, you're a diversity, equity, inclusion expert ex or a hotelier, you know, actually put in the chat what what you do for a living. And um, so that I know who I'm talking to and and we can address those different needs um, as we are with dietary restrictions. So my first question when we're talking about um, diversity, equity and inclusion is what is food diversity? What does diversity mean? You know, there's this slide here that we have, but put in the chat here, what what does diversity mean to you? And in this, you, you see a variety of different images here, but, um, and I've already asked you to tell me what you, what you do for a living. And now I'm asking you another question. So, you know, diversity, does it, we, we typically think of it, here, here's Jim and I, you know, male, female, right? Um, we talk about eight different age groups, like the gen, the two gentlemen having coffee together in the, in the company break room. Um, we talk about people who are visually impaired, who have religious-based practice, you know, re different religions, um, you know, or utilize a wheelchair, the, you know, and then black and white as well. And that's those diversity has been a big, huge topic that we've had over the last couple of years. Um, and, and we're going to continue to have over the course of the next couple of years. And it's something that's in our lives every single day. We're diverse in a variety of different ways. And when we think about equity, you know, there's equality or, um, equality and equity. Those are two different terms and they mean two different things. So if you're looking at this slide here and you, and typically you see it with a baseball picture, you know, people looking over a fence, but I like this image with the, with the apples, you know, this picture on the left, um, you can see everybody's stools are the same level, but when you're looking at above at their hands, their hands are at an angle. So the person, the, the young child can't reach the tree. And so it's not, it's an equality because everybody has the same level bench there. And, but in the second image with equity is everybody's got the bench or the step stool that is of the height that they need. And so now they all have an equal playing field in reaching those apples. And so that's what we're thinking about when we're when we're talking about food and beverage as well, is how does everybody have an equitable experience, not just an equal experience? Because equal, equal is everybody just gets a plate, right? But equity, how do we make sure that everybody's got the plate that they need? Um, Ken, I like what you said is embracing and enjoying the differences in everyone. And that includes how they eat. So, you know, and in inclusion, when we talk about inclusion, you've got the D, the diversity, you've got the equity, and then you've got the inclusion. That means everybody has the opportunity to participate together. And the one thing that I like about the definition of inclusion is that it means that everybody, it's an intentional opportunity, right? We're intentional with what we're doing. So we're going back to that other slide where it says, you know, equality and equity. We were intentional by giving everybody the different steps so that they needed 
for their height, right? And that that's the really the big part about inclusion is when we're we're really being intentional with our policies and procedures and our actions in making creating events that are inclusive. Um, the so my next question because we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and now we're and we're talking about food and beverage. What is food? In the you know pipe in here, tell me what food is, Jim. I know you've got a, you know a good thought process on what food is, um, and you're not eating the stuff on the right, I assume, anymore. You're on, yeah, you're on mute. Uh, James, would you like to come up and share? I know James actually, it's, it's food is so important to James at this stage. Yeah. Okay, I'm happy to share. Yes, I'm eating on the left side of that screen. Um, I'm completely whole food plant-based. In fact, uh, as of next Monday, I will have survived six years after my ischemic stroke. And um, the science tends to indicate that you can lose weight in a lot of ways, but to be healthy, it really is about the left side of that screen there. But yeah. inclusion, diversity, equity means we have to prepare for everyone and we have to make sure that everyone's needs are met, but that includes people who eat a proper diet, whatever you would call that, or perhaps one that is less healthy, but what they want. So there's a lot of choice and a lot of personalization. And I think as a former meeting planner, it's really, really tricky to be able to meet everyone's needs, but an awareness like what you're providing people is really that first starting point for everyone. Well, and and you, just you bringing you on the screen, it reminds me of an event that we were at in San Francisco and talking about the diversity and the inclusion of that. And you had just gone vegan or were working towards that right and you had asked for a vegan plate and what and you texted well, me it's it, it's such a great story and 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 the short approach and the lead up of that is that they had promoted the fact that they had vegan meals and out of the thousand people in the room they were serving i was the uh, thousandth person served and i know the weight person was really felt bad about that so she gives me my whole food plant-based plate which looked delicious she goes would you like scallops with that <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then, but then the other part of that too, is that you were the last one served at that table. So there's two funny things or not funny things. There's two really good points about that is one that you, she felt bad that you were eating plant-based, but she shouldn't because that's your choice. She offered you a scallop, but then also you were the last one to get fed. Well, I don't think she felt bad that I was eating plant-based. I think she felt bad that I was served last when obviously, gotcha. okay. uh, I, I think that's where it came from. It came completely out of wanting to take care of the customer, but it also comes from a lack of education and knowledge about what right. different eating styles are about. Right, exactly. And in, in this day and age with our lack of staffing, that becomes a, an even bigger issue. And so that we really have to focus on this. So thank you very much for sharing. Yay. Um, so, and then when we look at when, and when we, when we're talking about food, you know, it's somebody wrote in here, Katie, you wrote in here that it's nourishment, it's hundred percent nourishment, but it's so many other things as well. It's, it's community, it's family, it's traditions. And um, in this, the next slide there, we've got so many different opportunities that show what, food is there's in the bottom right hand corner um that older woman that's my grandmother celebrating her 90th birthday um with the cake the the servers on the left the farmer in the middle left right the bartender there's so many things because it's somebody's job it's somebody's um you know lifestyle it's it's the way they eat it's their religion it's it's scarcity for some and we've seen a lot of that um during covid right a lot of people who never thought they would have to go to a food bank have had to go to a food bank because they lost their jobs and so there's so many different emotions as well as tangible things that come with food and beverage and that's what makes us very diverse the food and beverage that we serve is very very diverse but also the way that we have to think about the inclusion aspect and the equity aspect Aspect of that. And this quote that I love from James, from James Beard is that it's food and beverage is our common ground, or it, I think it's eating is what he said. Eating is our common ground. It's our universal experience because we all have to eat. Right. And, but we, we may have to eat specific ways based on where we're from, what we believe in and what our body tells us we can and cannot eat. So I'm really thinking about how, you know, diverse, the food diversity that we have um, is really important in understanding that. And 
you know, and you might be surprised um, by that image of the person in the middle in the util- who's utilizing a wheelchair. You know, to me, it's not just what's on the plate that makes us the food diverse. It's how we get to the plate. And I think if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me tell the story of my friend Elise, who, who was t- attending an event together and we, she had to take an elevate, go to the back of the house at the hotel, take a go down the hallway, take another elevator down the back of the house to get to the food and beverage. And there was no one there to help her get the food off the buffet. And when she spun around to go find a seat or to roll up to a table, I should say, there was no table. There was no spot for her to do that because all the table chairs, all the tables had chairs around them and they had to remove, they removed all the chairs and then put a handicap sign on the table. So thinking about the diversity of how somebody accesses the food is also really important. And, and how can that person reach that food and beverage, especially if we're designing vertical buffets? Yeah. John put a good question in here. Um, Does anyone have a story like that? You know, I, I share my friend Elisa's story, but does anybody else know somebody that's had a, an issue accessing food? I would love to hear their story as well. Um, Thanks so much, Tracy. While we wait yeah. for the chats, uh, in one conference in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. uh, I had gotten injured. And you know, then Las Vegas, when you're at a conference, you got to do like 20, 30,000 steps a day. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, how am I going to make it to this conference? And I go, oh, it's, <clears throat> it's Vegas. So I just called the hotel and rented a scooter, mm-hmm. right? An electric scooter. That changed my experience of every meeting. Try running a five-day conference in the Cosmopolitan, which you know is huge, on a scooter, and you will know about access. And sometimes it's not about access. Like when you get in the elevator with a scooter, they look at you, let me, and now you all you can feel is judgment going, why is this, you know, <clears throat> quote unquote, younger guy in a like wheelbase scooter? And then mm-hmm. nobody says anything, but it, it's like that. Uh, my other experience was I was trying to get into Starbucks to get a drink. Uh, we were, I was on a drink order getting drinks for like five or six people. And they had set up the stanchion. So it was virtually impossible for me to turn right or left to get through. Looks like you have a chat from Kathy there. Yeah, Kathy, you went to a conference recently and gave your dietary restrictions a couple of months in advance. I don't eat gluten or dairy. Me too. Um, out of the 15 lunch options they offer everyone else, I was only able to eat two. And that's a huge issue. And, you know, looking at what is offered and how many times, you know, as a meeting planner, do you go through the menus and you have no idea what what any of your attendees can eat based on the dietary needs that they have? And, and really thinking about that and Kathy, one crazy story from 2010, I was working the Olympics in Vancouver and I gave my dietary needs of no dairy and no gluten. And they're like, okay, on day, on Mondays, you're going to eat chickpeas and curry and for breakfast and lunch. And on Tuesdays, you're going to eat black beans and rice. And on Wednesdays, you're going to eat chickpeas and curry. And then thir- so every other day was going to, I'm like, so you want me to eat beans for 21 days? That's what they were going, that's what they chose to feed me as an employee of the organization. And it was just the decision that they had made. And so I ended up having to bring in food, et cetera. So it is, that's, that really is a, I mean, how do you, I'm just curious, Kathy, how does that make you feel? Kathy, feel free to unmute if you'd like. Here she comes. Um, it uh, it did not make me feel great at all. Um, it just felt like me uh, being there didn't have any value, especially when they weren't willing to consider my dietary restrictions. And did they ask you in the re- they ask you in the registration? Yes, in advance, a couple months mm-hmm. in advance. If it was, you know, if I signed up for this conference, like let's say a week ahead of time, you know, I mm-hmm. could understand, or a couple weeks ahead of time. But the fact that I gave them so much notice, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Well, and then there's, and there's 15 items for, you know, 13, 15 items for everybody to eat. And there's only two for you. And what were those two items? Um, It was uh, a salad, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is pretty common. Yep. Um, And for one of them, it was like tortilla chips. Yeah. So that, (laughs) I mean, that's not a nutritious or an inclusive meal for anyone, right? Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about that. And so, and I actually went to an event and the only thing that, that I could eat, I couldn't even eat the tortilla chips. It was just the guacamole. So Mm -hmm. 
like I'm just going to spoon out and eat guacamole, which going back to avocado toast is a great thing, but I didn't even have something, the toast to put on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that sharing that story. Um, so a little bit about me before we jump into the rest of this and Joan Eisenstadt, thank you so much for always jumping in here and watching me. I appreciate that and participating. I, um, and Nicole Smith, you were here the other day. So appreciate you coming back as well. So I'm an event planner. I've been an event planner since 1990 when I was in college and social sorority, you know, planner and, and worked for the health center. Um, I've worked corporate, I've worked associations, I've worked food festivals, but I'm one of 32 million Americans with food allergies. And when I was a corporate planner, I couldn't eat at the hundred events that I was planning. And, and I do remember my friend Ron, like I, I got this plate of blueberries or whatever. And he's like, oh, I want that. And I'm like, well, I've got food allergies and this is, you're getting what you're getting. And I'm getting what this, what I'm getting because of my food allergies. And, and it was like a, a light bulb went off. And like, I have to start educating our industry on how to feed me as well as the other 100, 1500 people who were in the class that I took um, in New York city about, you know, understanding, you know, food and beverage as um, it was the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. So thinking about food and beverage differently. Um, and since then, I mean, before I be found out about my allergies, I was a certified events professional meeting manager. Um, and then, but since then I've become a health coach and a food protection manager. Um, and so really thinking about it differently. And over the last couple of years, 12 years, since I started my company, it really has changed into when I first spoke, I said, here's food allergies, here's celiac disease, here's vegan, and here's kosher, right? But it's turned into this entire conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's turned into a conversation about budgets and food waste as well. So it's a sustainability aspect of it as well. So we're going to get into this now. And then the next picture, this picture here was from an event that I attended. Sim and Kathy, that you'll kind of relate to this is like, I want, do you have anything? Do you have the gluten-free meal? And the server's like, oh, well, we don't have any gluten-free. We've got vegan and we've got the regular, but we don't have any gluten-free. And I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, cause I put it down there and, and she came back and she's like, nope, we don't have it. And I asked another server and he's like, nope, we don't have anything. And so that is what everybody is eating and I am not. And that is really, it ostracizes you. And, you know, I find out afterwards, they're like, oh, well, just raise your hand and somebody from the, from the organization will get you something. Well, if you're an attendee, that's not a meeting planner and you don't know, need, you don't know to go talk to a meeting planner or to a banquet captain or whatever, you just have the word of your server. And so it's, it, that's what I want us as planners to think about when we're, how do we communicate that? And how do we create that inclusive experience when we're doing this? And, and as Kathy said a second ago, we're relegated a lot of times to a bowl of berries or a salad. And it is just, I think this is the epitome of what diet, dietary restrictions have. Um, notice the croissant in the gluten-free. Yes, not gluten-free at all. Um, and besides, does anybody else have challenges that you've seen with your attendees not getting food or what they've been given? Um, and, and share those with me. It's, it's, it's mind boggling that this is what is done. And I don't know if it's the servers, if it, you know, where that disconnect with all of this comes into play. Um, another story I wanted to share is about some popcorn, a popcorn party, as well as a, a, a donut party. And, the popcorn was a client event that we did and we rented this popcorn machine and it automatically comes with the popcorn and the everything in that mix, right? And you put it in the top, turn it on and the, people were coming down because they could smell it and participating in the activities that we had. And we had one gentleman, he's like, hey, do you have any dairy, you know, butter-free popcorn? And I'm like, no, he's like, well, I'm vegan and I've got some friends who are dairy-free. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I do this for a living and I forgot to ask that, but it also just came with that package and it didn't think about it. And I felt horrible for the person organizing this. And this is what I do. And it was actually for an event for, you know, um, corporate compliance and ethics week. So it was really even more, you know, mind boggling that I had forgotten this, but um Okay, I'm going to jump in here and look at this from Facebook. Debbie, I was a meeting planner conference years ago and was and had told when I registered I eat gluten free. The plates served at lunches and dinner were so vile. I started bringing my own tuna so I could at least top a side salad with protein. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's it, it. How many people pull out something from their purse or their back pocket and, and eat it because that's all you've got? Well, the, when we were having an event the following day, I made note of this and we were having coffee and donuts. I'm like, okay, well, we've got to find some options for individuals. You know, this is from Dunkin' Donuts here. We're having it. And so I went to that gentleman and a couple other people that I knew were vegan. And I said, just to let you know, we've got soy-free, dairy-free, vegan, nut-free pastries that are coming along with the donuts. They did not believe me. I'm like, seriously, come and join us. And if you can see on that, on that slide there, or the poster there, we added, you know, vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free. They were like, oh my God, where did you buy this? And so I was giving them the name of Sally's Bakery in Atlanta because they were loving all of these different muffins that they could actually participate. But I think the big story about that is that they didn't trust. And, and when we ask the questions and we quote unquote, get burned, or we go hungry because somebody didn't think through the whole thing, even asking, that's where that that equitability and that inclusion or exclusion happens. And um, it really is important to figure out, you know, thinking through all of the steps of how that happens. The, um, when we're talking about, um, and I mentioned it earlier when we, when I was talking about inclusion is the, the word intent. And when you look up inclusion in the dictionary, it really does say that it's intentional, that we're making the efforts to do that. And that's what I did with those, with that, with those muffins and those, um, that banana bread, et cetera, is made sure that we had those options for people. And so it's really making sure that we're thinking through all of that. And it does. And I know that we've had somebody from a hotel on here um, in the, in the previous session saying that, you know, properties do want to make, you know, these options available, but they need to know in advance, but we also have to, you know, think through and, and ask those questions. So what can we do, or can we be intentional with our requests for proposals? And this is what we're doing. Right. So, and with, thinking about the intention of what we're doing as well. And I, and bringing, going back to that individual who utilizes a wheelchair, you know, when we're doing an event, say it's offsite on a beach, right? You've got this walkway here, you know, were you intentional in designing that walkway there? I met a former CSM who used to work at the hotel Dell in San Diego. And she said, when you design the walkway for the person you know, who utilizes the wheelchair, you know, to get out to the event, are you actually calling attention to their disability even more so Then why not designing the entire event, you know, so everybody's entrance way into that event is the same. So, but looking at this image, what is the intent at the end of that walkway? Um, and Jim, you have a good point. I, I, your name is James on there, and I I know you by Jim, so I'm going to mess that up all day. But um, don't often don't know how to make these types of dishes. 100% agree. And and I was ch chatting with a chef in April, and I was showing them that the Just Egg, which is a vegan egg product, um, and he's like, I've never even heard of that. And they didn't know what to do. He's like, and I don't think I can get that from my supplier, right? And so they're sometimes limited and also what they can buy. So we have to, again, really be intentional with off with our asks. Um, and um, Katie, exactly. Yep. I want my guests to like their requests. Yes, 100% that their requests are normal, right? They're not... I actually did a post, or I'm doing a post today on, uh, you know, ugly fruits and vegetables, right? Ugly fruits and vegetables used to be like, well, no way, we're not going to have them here, right? But that's what we kind of do with our attendees with dietary restrictions. We're like, we restrict you from participating. We want you to come to this event, but we don't want you to taste it, right? So how do we, how do we normalize it? And how do we make it so that it's not special? Because I don't like that word, as, as John typed in there for me. I like personalized plates. How we can we personalize or customize that experience for everybody? Um, I'm showing you in, in, in reaching for some food here is, is a slide that I have of a woman in, in, who utilizes a wheelchair. And you know she's reaching for those croissants. And thinking about the equity of it, I was 
in April, I was at this event and I was, we had some downtime between while we were breaking down and breaking down the breakfast. And I'm like, to the banquet manager, I'm like, let's talk about somebody who utilizes a wheelchair. And, and I had him, I'm sitting in that chair, you know, looking at it and trying to reach into the buffet to serve myself the food. Right. And so there's me trying to get whatever that is. And then the vertical buffet, you know, I can't reach that. And I love the fact that we had actually put the gluten-free croissants on the top level of that vertical buffet there, but I can't reach them because they're so high. So how do you, they're, 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 that's a conundrum in my opinion, because I do want the gluten-free on top so that the crumbs, when because if it's on the bottom, the crumbs from the non-gluten-free food would fall onto the gluten-free food. So that is a conundrum, but can we put that gluten-free product on a different table, right? Um, but how can, and then there's me trying to scoop out scrambled eggs. We have to be intentional with our design and what we're doing and thinking about that. And another image from this um, event that I shared on Facebook a while ago, Joan Eisenstadt really pointed it out to me. Um, and Joan, thank you for doing this. She, um, they had actually put the toaster in front of the bagels. So to get to the bagels that were on that similar silver, like high thing, you had to reach over the toaster. So that's a hazard in and of itself, right? Because they're having to reach over something that's plugged into an electrical outlet. So that's a whole different safety reason. Um, Katie wrote, my niece is an artist and drew years before avatars were so prevalent. Um, That would actually be really kind of interesting to, oh, you're talking about your image on there. There you go. I like that image too. Thank you. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, the so the next slide here is is kind of I'm I, you know I I use my hands here to push that out right. I'm like hey no I can't have peanuts. This is image that represents a story from um, Panera Bread and it was in the news so I can say their name. How many of you actually let me know in the chat. How many of you do events for internally for your corporations, right? And and responsible for making sure that your coworkers eat safely. Yes. Okay. A lot. Oh, a lot of you. Okay, great. Well, this person, he had a peanut allergy or a nut allergy, and his boss was um, harassing him saying, Hey, we're going to put peanut butter on your EpiPen. Oh, here, try this cookie. It doesn't have any nuts in it. It's just plain, you know, it's an oatmeal cookie with no nuts in it or try this. And so much so that his boss was doing it, that then his coworker started harassing him for that. He ended up quitting his job, going somewhere else where they valued him and sued Panera. Don't know how, for how much, cause it was done behind closed doors. But the fact that it was done and that was out there, it just, that's just not the kind of environment that we want. And the, <clears throat> I had a, an event that I worked a couple of years ago, a similar situation, but this gentleman was allergic to wheat and we were sitting at the awards banquet and he was sitting at the awards banquet and I was sitting at the staff table with my client and he came over and asked if he could join us. Because everybody at the table was like, oh, hey, John, you can eat this. Try this. Try this. Right. No, you don't have an allergy. Really? You can't be allergic to wheat. Come on, try this. And he this is a 50 year old man who's being ridiculed by his coworkers that he got up and left and went to work at it, sit at a different table. Um, that's not kind of the kind of experience that we want um, to do. Um, the. There, the, another story that I have is about a woman who has a fish allergy, and this is another workplace environment, right? She told her company, she told her boss, she told HR that she was allergic to seafood, could not be in the room with it. S- nobody would listen to her. It took like three months for them to put posters up or e- even to say anything to her about, to coworkers about it. She just said, I can't be near it. Can you just make sure that no fish, I'm having a hot flash, I'm turning on my fan if that's what you hear, um, just so you know. Um, and she ended up going to this Massachusetts Department of um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, or Employment and, and saying, hey, can you come in and, and do this? But the point about it is that she had so many allergic reactions at work from people bringing in food that she lost two to three weeks of work. So it's a lost productivity thing. And, and why does she why does she want to come to work? She's since left, left that company and, and found somewhere else to work. Um, 
two other examples that I want to share with you is one about a birthday cake and a client was taking, took their event to a restaurant. And typically, you know, we're not allowed to bring outside food and beverage into convention centers or hotels or to restaurants. And this, my, my friend who owns the restaurant said that he did allow this company to bring in an outside birthday cake. That cake was bought from Costco and his company or his staff He knew that somebody had a nut allergy and he was the chef that day, made sure that there was absolutely no nuts in anything that was served in the meals, the salads, you know, the three courses. And then they cut the cake and served it. She went to the emergency room within 30 minutes, probably less than that of taking a bite of the cake. Nobody and her company knew that she had a peanut allergy, but nobody looked at the label of the cake to say, hey, this was made in a facility with peanuts. Um, Tracy, Kate's got a great question right there. So how can we address food bullying better? Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. I think it's doing a lot of education, especially if you're internally, like doing some lunch and learns saying, hey, you know, here's, you know, Katie, Katie, I'm vegan and I'm going to teach you about what I eat, you know, as a vegan, what does this word mean? Right. And ensuring that we, we want to make sure that everybody's got something to eat. So doing some lunch and learns on different dietary restrictions, you know, right now, because it's Hanukkah coming in, having somebody come in and talk about, you know, what you can eat, what are the food traditions of Hanukkah and even Kwanzaa, right or during Ramadan, right? And ensuring that people are educated on what these are so that they can experience it, they can experience the taste of it. Um, and and they can, you know, bring in some latkes or bring in some um, Joan, I don't know how to say that word of the of the donuts, the fried foods during Hanukkah, right? So people can experience. And so it's really an opportunity to educate. I mean, as much as we talk about, hey, let's go to Italian or let's go to Asian or like, we're going to try Thai food today, right? People are curious about those different food um, cultures or or cuisines, right? Let's teach them about the different dietary restrictions as well. Um, Oh, (laughs) thank you, Amy Bailey. I appreciate that for hot flashes. Yes. Um, I heard of it, but I have not tried it. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Jim, you're right. It has to be supported at all levels of the organization. And, and just a different story on that is like, I know a company that went, did an awards dinner and, and this is John, this is not our friend, Jesse, but a CEO of a company was, is vegan. And at their awards dinner, he was handed a plate of roasted carrots and they had gone through it. The CEO had, you know, and the meeting planner had made sure that the hotel knew that the CEO was vegan and the time of the event, they served him carrots. And it's just not, we need to make sure that how we're addressing that going through. Um, my daughter has not allergies. She should always check the food labels. She never trusts a dessert or a bread item. Oh, really good point. And then sesame, sesame is becoming um, a different, it is, becoming it's just been named a top allergen in the United States and will need to be required on food labeling January 1st, but it is another hidden ingredient and stuff. And so it's really like that cake potentially could have had not that birthday cake, but let's just say it was a pie could have shredded nuts on it and she would know, right. Or hidden in it. The last example I want to sh- share here is in a new employee. And this is my friend, Um, who I interviewed for um, my podcast, Eating at a Meeting, Amelia. She worked for tech company. She worked for a food service company that managed the company cafeteria. And she grew up with a family. Her sister's allergic to quite a few foods. So she taught all of the chefs in the culinary, in the kitchen, hey, if you're making something, you need to make sure you labeled it. She made sure that she communicated got the list of of food allergies and dietary restrictions of all the employees in that company. She, she sourced all of the meat so that it was halal. So everything, but the pork was halal certified meat, chicken and beef and everything. And, but then they had a new employee who was kosher, who's Jewish and ate kosher. She sat down with him. They had this conversation on what what he could and couldn't eat, what he was comfortable with, et cetera. She figured out what she could and couldn't do. And, because breakfast and lunch was free for the, and that tech company for all employees, even the guests of the employees, um, 
the company actually, because they couldn't, she couldn't accommodate it in the kitchen, what he needed. The company ended up subsidizing his salary for the amount of money breakfast and lunch would cost for every single day. So five days, so five times four, five times 40, 20 days of work, uh, you know, that's what he got extra in his paycheck every single month because of that's how they made that, that equitable experience around food and beverage and let him feel included. Um, and Jim writes sesame is in tahini, it's in bread, it's in a variety of sesame seed bun at McDonald's, right? Um, and it's a lot of these allergens and we're, we're thinking about allergens, but we're also thinking about vegan options. A lot of vegan options are made with nuts, peanuts and tree nuts and soy, um, and wheat. And those are top nine allergens as well. So really thinking through and having conversations with that. One other really good story about dietary restrictions is an event that I worked on for SpinCon for Senior Planners Industry Network. And this woman had an apple allergy. She had written in the in the in the registration form that she had an apple allergy. She could not be in the room with it. And so I reached out to Spin and we said we're going to make this event completely apple free, except for you know these iPhones and and computers, et cetera. And we sent her a note saying we're doing this. And she's like, you have no idea the blessing that you're giving me. You know, it brings me to tears that you're making these accommodations for me. And she she almost died from eating a banana that was in a bowl and apple was in the year before, or the, not the year before, but the day before a year would be a really long time. But she she really appreciated the gratefulness or she, her gratefulness to us in providing that experience for her so she could participate. And we had, we put notes in the event app. We had the MC make a note, we had, or make a comment. And we really communicated it out. This is what we're going to do. We, we had one woman who complained and she just couldn't fathom how this woman could go out of the house or even go to the grocery store with an apple allergy because she just, but I'm like, we're not worried about that part. We're worried about our event space. We had three rooms, four rooms, and this is where we needed the food to be completely apple free. And I worked with the chef to do it. And it, it took a little bit of extra time, but it was really worth that effort. And because you know, and she was even more grateful for it because she could eat with us eating because eating together. Um, I'm right. I'm going to finish that in a second. I'm going to reach out here and see what Debbie has here from Facebook live. Debbie wrote the hotel facility staff have to have better training. Yes, ma'am. I agree. And food labeling should be standard, not only when the food is being served, but on the food and beverage menus as well. So planners can make choices up front. A hundred percent agree with you. And I had one hotel tell me, oh, well, we'll figure it out for you. No, I mean, especially right now when we've got um, limited staffing, you know, or staffing shortage on both sides, why not go ahead and label the food so that we as planners don't have to have 25 conversations going back and forth with you. It, you know, you're in the kitchen, you've got to make this food for us. So why not go ahead and label it so it's much easier? And um, the, the one challenge, actually, how many of you um, have guests that come from international? From, from Europe specifically, you know, international attendees from there. Tanya says yes. Um, and because, and this goes back to Debbie's comment is that if you do have European co-workers that are coming to the U.S. for events or, you know, or you're going to the EU for an event, in they do have a law that actually requires the labeling to be there. And on unpackaged food, the law in the U.S. is that it's only on prepackaged food. And I don't have anything prepackaged to show you, you know, prepackaged food where it says contains, right? But in the European Union, it has to be on all unpackaged food served directly to a consumer. So you're thinking a quick trip gas station has to have the labeling, a hotel has to have a labeling, the convenience store, the grocery store, they all have to have labeling for the top allergens in the EU, EU and that's 14 of them. So, but eating together is a really important aspect of our jobs and our, and, and our events, right? We sit down and we, we enjoy an event together. And with Jim, who'd mentioned, you know, he, he got his meal late, right? How does that impact that experience? It's not just Jim's experience. It's everyone else at that table, because how many of you were raised to wait until Jim gets his meal? 
right? You don't want to eat because Jim doesn't have it, doesn't have food yet. And my niece even said that when she was nine years old, she's like, I feel guilty that you have food and I don't. And that's a real life experience, not just for the person who's not eating, but for the, everybody else at the table. And I love this quote from that I found online that eating together is more, is a more intimate act than looking over an Excel spreadsheet together. Um, And that intimacy spills over into the workplace because when we can share that pizza or we can share that salad or other things like that, um, we, we, it builds a better relationship. Um, okay. I thought you were saying, telling me that Shauna Suko was on here, but you're talking about spin and Shauna found that. Yes, she did find that, um, that organization, um, a different statistic that I found from, um, the Jane O'Reilly university, Jane O'Reilly from the university of Ottawa, Ottawa is about that 70% of employees experience exclusion. I mean, and that's really sad. And 40% of 48% have been harassed or bullied. And that's going back to that conversation I mentioned about being bullied. So it's really learning how to let's walk in others' footsteps. Let's eat other people's plates if you're able to, of course, but sharing that food experience of what different cultures are, what different, you know, John's in the Pacific Northwest. I'm in the South. What kind of, what's the differences? John, how do you eat your collards? Do you even eat collards? (laughs) <laughs> That's a good question. Collards? Uh, no, not often, except for uh, there are some great uh, southern restaurants here in Seattle that serve some of the best collards. So if I'm going to eat collards, it's going to be good good collards. Okay, good. Yeah. And I'm uh, hoping those southern restaurants aren't every single thing is not fried because not every single thing in the South is fried. And that's a, that's the, you know thing, a thought process too. We don't have to have all fried food. And what I did share, though, with Tracy is that in Portland, a friend who's a celiac shared with me one of the best gluten-free fish and chip restaurants I've ever eaten at. So I don't wow. have the name, but definitely look it up. Gluten-free yeah. fish and chips if you're in Portland. Well, and then, and actually there's a restaurant here in Durham, North Carolina. He got named best restaurant in the Southeast this year. And it's a, it's a sea, fried seafood joint and it's all completely gluten-free because he uses cornmeal and everything. So I can go and eat like eight different kinds of shrimp and, or not different kinds of shrimp, but eight different kinds of fish and then shrimp and, and, you know, completely free of gluten because that's the way he chose to do his restaurant. But, you know, when we're talking about this being harassed and, but we let's look about the inclusiveness perceptions of inclusion mean that somebody cares about me, you know, someone, um, my opinion account. So going back to Kathy, you know, saying, Hey, I shared with you that I'm gluten-free and dairy-free. What? you you read that but you didn't do anything about it or you you provided me a salad and some chips right so how is that really actually showing that you care and for all of you who are doing events if any of them are incentive events think about this right they've just sold their sold the number of widgets they could possibly sell and they won this incentive trip right you're sending them to Timbuktu you know, on this incentive trip and they've communicated that they have dietary needs, but there's nothing for them to eat while they're there for this whole week long trip. How is it? Are they going to go want to sell those widgets next year? I mean, that's kind of like what Kathy said and what I said, you know, I felt it's like, it doesn't, you, you don't care that I sold these number. Only you care about the money that I made you instead of me as a person. And I think we're seeing a lot more of that as people are coming back to work um, millennials and baby boomers, we want that sense of caring for each other. And, um, so it company culture and and health is really, really important right now. 25% of people, um, percent of employees, um, say eating healthier food, um, they actually feel better. They have a higher performance level. And, and that's really important with what we're doing. Right. And And that includes with how we're designing the food and beverage. So one of the things that I want you to think about too is because I just said, hey, if you're doing an incentive trip and I've mentioned the company cafeteria, but where is food in your event, right? And this image is supposed to represent where's Waldo, the red and white stripes. I hope everybody got that, but if you didn't, no worries. But, But think about where is food in your event? Tell me in the chat or come up and tell me where do you, besides the catered 
functions that you do, you know, where is food and beverage in your event? Anybody you want to pop in and share where there, do you have it in green rooms? Do you have it in the catered functions? Feel free where are you? If you'd like. Yeah. To there was one woman um, in my eating at a meeting Facebook group said that she stopped serving food altogether at their events and just letting everybody, you know, figure it out on their own. Well, what if you have a group of 3000 people, right? And have you checked out that property, the hotel that, or the venue that you're having the event in? Is there a place for them for 3000 people to eat? And how long is that food and beverage um, time period to get something? And then have you also communicated to all of those restaurants in the property as well as outside the property that they're going to get inundated with their outside of their normal lunch meals um, with all these individual people? Can and you put a, a great chat here about gifts and room drops. I, I of course, mm -hmm. attended some in-person meetings and forgot how much I love amenities, but there's mm -hmm. nothing worse than getting an amenity, spending all the time, money, and resources, and then being allergic to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Carly, great. On buses, room deliveries, breaks, catered meals, restaurants, yep. Um, room drops. And and John, I'm, I've gotten that. I've, I get handed a bottle of wine, crackers, and cheese, and, and whatever, and I can't, you can't eat it. And so it's a waste of food and it's a waste of your money because you didn't think about that. I actually went to an event recently and um, the guy was delivering his amenity, the amenity to me. And I was in my room and I'm like, Hey, is that by chance gluten-free? He's like, no, but give me a few minutes. And about 20 minutes later, he came back with gluten-free option for me, which I thought was great. But why was that not thought about ahead of time? Right? So it really is about, you know, who are you serving? How are you serving them? What? you're serving them and where, right? And then who, what, where, when, and why? Why are you bringing them together, right? Are you, what are you doing for them? Do you want them to come here? Do you want them to come back? Um, one association planner asked me years ago, she's like, hey, we've got an attendee with a pepper allergy. And my executive director is like, nobody can have a pepper allergy. We're not going to worry about that. And, and I was doing a co-session with Tyra, Hill, Tyra um, Warner, um, who's an attorney. I'm like, all right, Tyra, talk about the attorney aspect of this first. And then, and then I looked at the planner. I'm like, does that person's dollars value, a membership dollars matter to you, right? Does that person's participation in your event matter to you? And I think that person was on the board. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, then what's the question? Why won't you provide for that? Um, okay. So one, I just, one more story here is about a girl that I found on Twitter, gluten-free and glittery. And she had, was eating in a restaurant and she told the server on day one, you know, about her dietary restrictions. That server went above and beyond to find her some gluten-free food. And this is in Italy. Um, and, so, but the next day she came in for the meal and this waitress, another waiter, waiter was serving her. And this waitress from the day before starts running across the field or the field, running across the restaurant saying, don't serve her that she can't have that, you know, and, and, but she felt going like the apple allergy, she felt cared for and she felt, Hey, this person's also learning to train somebody. So all of this being said is that we really need to be aware of, of, of going back to the other side, who, what, where, when, why, what we're doing. And as individuals who are responsible for ordering food and beverage, educating others on why we're doing this and, and making sure that we're creating that experience. So that was a lot. I have six minutes left, which I'm a little bit over what I was going to share with you, but I do have a way for you to get more information about this because I'm telling you, I've been doing this for 12 years and I still learn every single day, but I've pulled together in a course called Every Meal Matters, a, a humongous toolkit of, of resources for you and ways to really think through, work with you to think through where food and beverage is in your events and how to do this. Um, my friend Deidre here is got a... Um, is going to give you a video testimonial of attending one of my sessions in the past, um, which you just did yourself. But um, here, what, listen to this video from Deidre. 
so this is Deidre Young live from the NEC in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And as always, Tracy has delivered a great session on food. I always learn something new. And I was sitting there going, hmm, for half of the session about things that I hadn't thought about. So here's a hint. When you're planning your food and beverage, think about who's eating it, how they're going to access it, and what do you do if they have an allergic reaction? That's just a hint. <laughs> Till next time. So she, she was just reiterating what I just said too, but this is what I go over in my Every Meal Matters course. It's a one of a kind training. I spent months putting it together. Um, and oh, actually I can say years, like 12 years putting this together because it really does break down how we do this and how we have to think about it and be more strategic as planners about this. Um, it, it teaches you how to be safely and confidently execute these events um, and learning how to boost the bottom line you know, with your event attendees. So the, what comes with the course um, are, are conversations about current food and beverage trends, um, how to exceed and meet your financial goals. And one an example of that is like back in April, I actually did worked an event and we had during Passover, we had three different people um, following um, kosher diets. And because I asked the questions and I worked with them, I saved my client $3,000 on that food and beverage, those kosher meals. So things like that on what you need to do. Um, tools and techniques to create safe experiences. Pre it's live as well as pre-recorded videos. And the modules that we have um, that we go through over the course of the eight weeks um, are opportunities on obligations. What is vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, kosher, halal, plant, whole food, plant-based? What are all those different term, terms mean? How to strategically plan for this? Um, how to communicate to all of the different people that we have to communicate with? And um, and then through safety, sustainability, menu design, and ex and then executing the experience. What happens on site when you're doing this? Right? You, they were just delivered a plate of carrots. What do you do in that? You know, when when that happens or after that happens? How do you recover from that? Um, lots of quizzes, hot seat sessions, and we have. Um, the course is valued at three thousand, just under three thousand dollars. Again, I said it's eight modules. It's a lifetime access to the course content. It's lifetime access to me to ask me questions, um, an entire how-to library. And we also have some bonuses for you to for signing up. Um, again, it, one of them is the eight weeks of live Q&A sessions. And that's an hour, hour and a half every single week to do those Q&A. Um, we have a private member, member members only Facebook group where you can ask questions of each other, post comments, how are you doing this, et cetera. And then one-on-one -on -one discussions with industry experts. This gentleman here is Nick Urson. He's the food and beverage director out of New Orleans. I've had executive chefs. I've had an advocacy or um, food inclusion experts, or not food inclusion experts, but diversity and inclusion experts, as well as disability, individuals with disabilities chatting with the people. Um, Again, it's it's a three thousand dollar value, but I'm offering it for for nine hundred ninety seven dollars, and it's the end of the year. If you've got any leftover training funding, great time to use that funding. The class starts on January 9th. Um, and the quote from my friend Tahira, um, you know, she does inclusive event design all the time through for IMAX and Site and a variety of different organizations. But she said she still learned a lot from me in this course. So. Again, it starts January 9th. There is the link to get it. Um, John's got that in the, the chat there. Um, and one extra bonus that I'm going to give you, um, I've talked about it, or I don't know if I talked about it actually, but our meal cards, right? A great way for your attendees to communicate their dietary needs to the server. So like when Jim said, hey, I'm vegan, he could give this card. Um, but I've got 36 different types of cards. It comes in a pack of 50 and I will give you six packs of your choice of those um, cards. So sign up uh, there. And, um, but anyways, any questions? Does anybody have questions about what I've talked about? Any questions about the course? I'm here for you. Katie, you can use these. Okay. Jim, yeah. Jim, thank you for the love. Good. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute. Uh, yeah, please come up here and let's chat. 
Excellent. Let's do this, Tracy. We're going to end the, the live stream. Let's uh, say thank you to our mm -hmm. live stream guests. Mm -hmm. And thank you for tuning in. Again, feel free to click for more information.